Hello, this is Julie with A Course in Miracles reading. This is Chapter 1, Section 2, Revelation, Time, and Miracles. Revelation induces complete but temporary suspension of doubt and fear. It reflects the original form of communication between God and His creations, involving the extremely personal sense of creation sometimes sought in physical relationships. Physical closeness cannot achieve it. Miracles, however, are genuinely interpersonal and result in true closeness to others. Revelation unites you directly with God. Miracles unite you directly with your brother. Neither emanates from consciousness, but both are experienced there. Consciousness is the state that induces action, though it does not inspire it. You are free to believe what you choose, and what you do attests to what you believe. What stands out for me there is miracles unite you directly with your brother, and just the idea that every day is for miracles, and I think miracles usher in revelation. Okay, revelation is intensely personal and cannot be meaningfully translated. That is why any attempt to describe it in words is impossible. Revelation induces only experience. Miracles, on the other hand, induce action. They are more useful now because of their interpersonal nature. In this phase of learning, working miracles is important because freedom from fear cannot be thrust upon you. Revelation is literally unspeakable because it is an experience of unspeakable love. Awe should be reserved for revelation to which it is perfectly and correctly applicable. It is not appropriate for miracles because a state of awe is worshipful, implying that one of a lesser order stands before his creator. You are a perfect creation and should experience awe only in the presence of the creator of perfection. The miracle is therefore a sign of love among equals. Equals should not be in awe of one another, because awe implies inequality. It is therefore an inappropriate reaction to me. That would be Jesus. An elder brother is entitled to respect for his greater experience and obedience for his greater wisdom. He is also entitled to love because he is a brother and to devotion if he is devoted. It is only my devotion that entitles me to yours. There is nothing about me that you cannot attain. I have nothing that does not come from God. The difference between us now is that I have nothing else. This leaves me in a state which is only potential in you. Uh, the part that stands out for me is equal should not be in awe of one another because awe implies inequality and for the miracle to come we need to be in that moment of no fear and resistance which is that moment of equality and if there's awe it's the perception of difference so if I stay in that equality then I can be moved, <laughs> I can be moved and directed. No man cometh unto the Father but by me does not mean that I am in any way separate or different from you except in time, and time does not really exist. The statement is more meaningful in terms of a vertical rather than a horizontal axis. You stand below me and I stand below God. In the process of rising up, I am higher because without me, the distance between God and man would be too great for you to encompass. I bridge the distance as an elder brother to you on the one hand and as a son of God on the other. My devotion to my brothers has placed me in charge of the sonship, which I render complete because I share it. This may appear to contradict the statement, I and my father are one. But there are two parts to the statement in recognition that the Father is greater. Revelations are indirectly inspired by me because I am close to the Holy Spirit and alert to the revelation readiness of my brothers. 
I can thus bring down to them more than they can draw down to themselves. The Holy Spirit mediates higher to lower communication, keeping the direct channel from God to you open for revelation. Revelation is not reciprocal. It proceeds from God to you, but not from you to God. And I just like to think about this, the direct channel from God to all of us and keeping that open. And who keeps it open? The Holy Spirit does, so that's not even my job. The miracle minimizes the need for time. In horizontal plane, the recognition of the equality of the members of the sonship appears to involve almost endless time. However, the miracle entails a sudden shift from horizontal to vertical perception. This introduces an interval from which the giver and receiver both emerge farther along in time than they would otherwise have been. So it's like as you rise up, then time collapses and your learning time is shorter. The miracle thus has the unique property of abolishing time to the extent that it renders the interval of time it spans unnecessary. There is no relationship between the time a miracle takes and the time it covers. The miracle substitutes for a learning that might have taken thousands of years. It does so by the underlying recognition of perfect equality of giver and receiver on which the miracle rests. The miracle shortens time by collapsing it, thus eliminating certain intervals within it. It does this, however, within the larger temporal sequence. And this came to mind just now as I was reading this. When my children have fallen, small children, and there's that interval after they've fallen and you don't know if something has gone wrong, an ego would tell me, check their mouth, check the part on their leg that they just fell on. And um, spirit tells me, just sit, just be, just wait, just focus. And so I don't look to the body to tell me what happened. And inevitably, there's nothing wrong. <laughs> we just wait for the period to pass and there's nothing wrong. But it's not like I can say, hey, here's what you do when a kid falls down and you remember to do that and you apply it. It's just what happens in the moment? What happens in the moment? What Where's your guidance? What does it tell you to do? And and then their needless suffering is eliminated. Eliminated. <laughs> okay. Wishing you well today.